Hi everyone and welcome to our Rock Harbor Church Prophecy Update. It's our desire to bring the events that are happening from a biblical perspective and also a prophetic perspective. So thanks for watching us today. The topic we want to talk about this week is how to deal with how angry we are becoming over all these things that are happening in our world. There's a lot of things that are happening that we just shake our heads and we're, it makes us sick. We see the way the culture is going. There's no stopping it. We've lost the culture war. We see our country getting turned upside down into a communist regime by the left. We see apostasy. We see false doctrine. We see Christians caving in. We see the problems that Israel has in the Middle East. We see Gog of Magog forming. And we're seeing a total transformation of the entire world heading towards a one world government, one world religion, and all the things that are predicted. Now we know all this is predicted. We know we have to deal with it. But unfortunately, what a lot of the remnant is, is experiencing is anger and frustration over this. Now on one side, we know it's gonna happen. We know it's supposed to be this way. But at the other time, at the other side, it makes us very angry to watch this all happen. And I just want to note a few things that make all of us angry, and then we'll talk about how to handle our anger in these last days. Well, recently there was an Episcopal priest, and, and it's a woman priest uh, in the Episcopal religion, and obviously it's, she's an apostate. She's a longtime abortion activist by the name of Catherine Ragsdale. And she said, this is a, a so-called Christian Episcopal priest, okay, put that in air quotes because she's really not, but she said, abortion providers are some of my personal heroes and modern day saints, she said. And so she's been appointed um, recently to serve as CEO and president of the National Abortion Federation. Now, when you see something like that, that makes us angry because here's someone who claims to be a Christian. I'm not saying she is a Christian, but she's claiming to be a Christian and saying that she's for abortion, killing babies in the womb. That's evil. But that's also frustrating to watch as a Christian when you see a fake Christian promoting murdering babies. We all get angry. We all get frustrated. We have a righteous indignation towards that. And this is the kind of things I'm talking about. Or how about this? Like, Pope Francis, who, he, this guy's a wackadoo. He is so out of his mind, it's not even funny. He is a false teacher, false prophet. And if this guy is not the, fault, the false prophet of tr the tribulation period, I don't know who will be. So this guy has made the environment a signature cause of his pontificate. Said he was strongly considering adding the category, get this, of ecological sin to the Catholic Church official teachings. So along with you know, abortion and murder and homosexuality, he's now going to add sin against the environment. He has called, by the way, if you don't know this, global warming a major threat on our planet. He sees global warming, which is a hoax, that that's more of a threat to humans than the threat of dying and going to hell. So this guy doesn't care about the gospel. He cares more about worshiping the planet. That's what he really cares about. And he's called for the reduction of use of fossil fuels. I mean, and this guy's a complete leftist, uh, tree hugger type of, of radical environmentalist. Now he's going to add a sin category of sinning against the planet. This is how messed up this guy is. And then he also blames, obviously, capitalism or the free market system for plundering the earth and, and at the expense of future generations. Again, you and I know this guy's out of his mind. He's a false teacher, false prophet. We shouldn't expect anything different. But at the same time, it angers us. It makes us frustrated that this kind of person could rise to such a level and then spew this venom. He speaks like a dragon. And so, again, we walk away from a situation saying, I don't get it, it's frustrating, and there's nothing I can do about it. 
So it makes us very, very angry. Anyway, another thing that makes us all frustrated is the constant issues going on in the Middle East with Israel. They're always constantly lying about Israel, making things up. And just recently, prophecynewswatch.com reported that um, these leftists, these UN people, even the Palestinians, make up this myth or lie of what they call progressive Palestine, okay? There's no such place as Palestine. There's no such thing as a Palestinian people. They're Arabs. They're Jordanian refugees. But anyway, they keep this lie going. And anyway, this, this progressive Palestinian myth is that if they could create a state of Palestine from the river to the sea, as they say, and supposedly ridding the, the land of the nation of Israel, then everything would be fine. And, and, and yet, few want to talk about what the polls indicate and what sort of state that would be when 89% of the so-called Palestinians want Sharia law and 66% of them want to support the death penalty for Muslims who convert to another religion. This is what the UN wants? This is what the leftists and globalists want? Is this kind of people ruling over a one state of Palestine and getting rid of the nation of Israel? That's what they want? Yes, it's very frustrating. Very frustrating to see, very frustrating to deal with this mentality. And again, you're, you and I are not gonna make an argument that convinces the UN or any of these leftists or globalists that they're wrong. Think about this. Guys, do you think you're gonna sit in front of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Nancy Pelosi or Rashida Tlaib or Ilhan Omar or any of these people and convince them otherwise? convince them that the perpetrators are the Muslims in that area, that, that practice Sharia law, that want Sharia law, that blow themselves up and name streets after those who, who are suicide bombers and pay money to them? Do you think you're going to convince them otherwise? No, you're not. And that's a very frustrating place to be anymore. It angers us that you can't dialogue with anybody anymore and show them evidence, show them the facts, and convince them otherwise. We're at a point now where facts and truth don't matter to people. It doesn't matter. And now even if you try to defend yourself with the truth, with facts and the truth and whatnot and evidence, it doesn't matter to them. They don't care. So we're reaching a point in time where people have lost their minds. They have a narrative and they must stay on that narrative regardless of the truth. Truth is no longer uh, relevant to them anymore. That's frustrating. That makes us angry. How about these other stories in regards to Israel? The Israeli Defense Force tweeted this week that in 14 hours, more than 450 sirens sounded in Israel, which meant that more than 190 rockets launched into Israel. Of course, 90% of the rockets were intercepted uh, but again, what nation on the planet has to deal with this? And yet Israel's the criminal? You see how they've turned it? That's very frustrating. That's the facts. But no one cares about the facts. In fact, the UN makes Israel the biggest violator of human rights on the planet. And yet the Palestinians have zero uh, complaints against them. It's just an upside down world. But again, what I'm talking about makes us frustrated. Or how about our frustration with Islam? Islam's never going to get itself right and never can be because it's a religion and it's a, a form of a new government. Uh, so it's a quasi-governmental, political, with a little religion thrown into it, movement. So it's not going to change. No, Islam is not going to repent. But unfortunately, what's happened, like in, in uh, Europe, they've taken over there. And now, like we hear about uh, from uh, places like Sweden, they've turned to Islamists for new votes. So what do they do? They cater to them. These Islamists now in Sweden and other parts of Europe are becoming the most vocal and best organized groups in their countries. And so they're gaining a lot of traction with the political leaders there. Well, we see the same thing happening in the U.S. We're not far behind. And we're watching the promotion of this through uh, CARE and other Muslim Brotherhood-linked groups 
promoting this. And so now politicians are caving into Islam, Sharia law, or whatnot. And that's very frustrating and it angers us. And then obviously the LGBT movement, which is nothing but a mafia, which is nothing but a bully. And when I say this, I'm not talking about every gay or lesbian person. I'm talking about the LGBT movement itself. These hardcore leftists uh, that are promoting uh, Marxism and things of that nature, and they're nothing but a mafia or bullies, okay? I'm talking about that. So I want to separate the organization out from the individual, okay? Well, anyway, they're pushing their transgender movement tactics now, and it's pretty predictable. But now they're going against basic biology, basic chemistry of the human body. And now if you come to them and tell them, look, biologically this person's a male, biologically this person's a female, they, are, they, they don't care about the facts. They just come at you and say, you're wrong. How dare you say someone's not a boy if they feel differently? And the next move for them, it's going to be they're going to root out heretics uh, according to their rules. So you and I would be the heretic. So if you're in a business, you're in a company, you're in a church, and they go supporting the LGBT movement, guess who's the new heretic? You and I. Is that frustrating? Of course it's frustrating. It angers us. Or how about the, the new end times DNA tampering that we've talked about? We've talked about being in the days of Noah. We're now watching scientists, doctors, get involved in human genetic editing which has become a reality now. And this is, this is terrifying to think about. This, this kind of technology is being brought where you can genetically modify the human race. Again, as you look at this meddling into DNA, you're, they're starting to play God. And when you do this, this is like in the days of Noah when the DNA is being tampered with by fallen angels and created monsters, created giants. And this is potentially devastating. Well, we know how that world ended back then. It came with a flood. Well, next time, it's not going to be a flood. It's going to be fire of the tribulation period. And God's going to end that and stop that. But we're, we're, we're watching this, and it's scary, and it's angry at the, at, at the same time because we can't do anything about it. Or the continued attack on babies in the womb. Dailywire.com reported that journalists who, who have exposed Planned Parenthood's baby body parts, remember that? They... they they filmed them undercover. Well, those people who filmed them undercover got found guilty, not Planned Parenthood. And the jury, who apparently doesn't have a brain, uh, decided to side with Planned Parenthood and said that uh, these people who did the undercover video, um, that's illegal. You can't do that. And, and so it's like, what world are we living in? They're not going to protect babies. They would rather protect Planned Parenthood, who sells baby parts. That's who they're protecting. Very frustrating. Very angry about that. And then we watch our, our, our Christian freedoms, our religious freedoms disappear. We have people like Ellie Golding. Um, who's going to sing on Thanksgiving Day for the, for the Cowboys game, the football game that's going to be played on Thanksgiving. Well, she's threatening to pull out of the show if the Cowboys don't get rid of the Salvation Army. Um, because the Salvation Army takes a stand for biblical marriage, and she sees them as anti-LGBT, and so... She said, if you don't get rid of the Salvation Army, I'm not performing. Well, if I was the Cowboys, I would say, bye-bye. Get out of here. We're not getting rid of the Salvation Army. Well, but it, it will be interesting to see what the Cowboys do, if they're going to get rid of the Salvation Army or not. Maybe they'll cave into Ellie Goulding. You know, and, and so we're seeing that. And it's like, where, where is an organization like the Salvation Army have its religious freedom? How come? How come they can be bullied by Ellie Goulding? Uh, it's just insane. Or how can the Cowboys sit there and let Ellie Golding uh, bully her? I, I would send her packing and I'll get another person. And I would tell them, forget them. Uh, but again, that's the world we're living in. And it's extremely frustrating to watch. The other item that makes us all frustrated is to watch Christian persecution around the world. And it's growing. 
and it's spreading. Anti-Christian persecution is all over the planet now. And it's increasing in the severity of it. If you follow some of the, the websites that track Christian persecution, it is at an all-time high. It's crazy out there. And it's coming close now um, to meeting what they call international definition of genocide. And in some of these places, that's what's occurring. And so obviously we pray for the persecuted church, but it makes us very angry to hear that. Or how about the new thing of the sex education in schools? And this has not stopped. Chefs, uh, in, in, in the dailywire.com reports that uh, Shaftesbury Kids, a division of a Canadian production company, Shaftesbury Film, has produced a series of sex educational videos for children titled Sex Ed School. And it's obviously outraged parents. They're, they're up in arms. But the videos show classrooms of young children discussing such issues as transgenderism, masturbation, and, and, and it's, it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. Again, if you send your kids to public schools, this is the stuff they're going to get. You may want to double think about putting your kid into a public school. This is at, at, at a gross, abominational level of what they're doing to our kids in these classrooms. So again, guys, a lot of this, what I mentioned, is just examples of the things that constantly bombard us and make us angry, make us frustrated. So again, here's the deal. It's not going to get any better. So we have to learn how to handle this anger and frustration. And it is a righteous indignation. We see wrong. And righteous indignation was ex exemplified by our Lord uh, twice when he, he drove the money changers out of the temple twice. That's a righteous indignation. God has a righteous indignation. And all these items I, I picked up and showed you today, we have a righteous indignation. It, it's, it's difficult to deal with and it makes us angry. Well, the issue is, how are we going to use that anger? What do we do with it? Um, and, and so that will be the key moving forward in these last days. Understand that anger is a God-given emotion to us. It's a, it's a gift. It is used to protect something that's very valuable whether that's the truth or a person or whatever, it gives us the energy to take a stand against injustice. It gives us the energy to do something for righteousness sake. That's what anger is supposed to do in a biblical way. So we can be angry. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be frustrated. It's just to know how to use it properly. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand where a lot of their anger is coming from. We obviously see that the anger is coming from these situations but we notice that most people are sent over the edge because of it. And usually it's because of deep issues in the person's soul that has never been dealt with. So for instance, we don't want to be, we see these things, it makes us angry, but we don't want to go off the scale with it. And a lot of people go off the scale. They, they get extremely angry and, and beyond, beyond, beyond normal. Well, it's tied to several things. First of all, you have to understand where you're at in your own personal anger in general. First of all, anger comes from being hurt. You're wounded. Somewhere in your past or whatever, uh, someone did something to you that's bad, and, or they hated you, they slandered you, or they persecuted you, or whatnot. So when you see these things happen in the world, it triggers, it, it, it sets us off. Uh, because we still are wounded uh, in our, in our, and hurt, and that causes us to be anger, angry beyond normal. Or sometimes we fear, and fear causes a lot of anger. So when you see the way the world's becoming, a lot of people feel that their future is threatened. They feel very insecure about it. They feel out of control. They feel powerless. Like I said, in a lot of these issues, there's nothing you and I can do. And so we, we start getting angry because we feel powerless, and that's due to being afraid of our lives changing. But again, we've got to remember, our future is in God's hands, and he's promised a glorious future. These people are not threatening our future. Our future is secure and locked up with the Lord. And you have to keep reminding yourself of that. 
as you see your life threatened, as you see your way of life threatened, you have to understand, don't focus on the present, focus on the future that God has for you. And that will kind of subside your anger to know that nothing's been taken away from you. Anyway, another thing that causes anger and causes us to go to the nth degree is injustice. And we see a lot of injustice. I pointed out a lot of injustice in this, this program. Um, but the issue then becomes, have you suffered injustice in your past uh, or somewhere in your life and you're holding on to the offense? You're holding on to the penalty phase that you feel should be executed by you. And this is an unresolved anger that's taken root in your heart. So what happens is when you see the injustice in the world, it reminds you of the injustice that's been done towards you. And if you don't handle that correctly, it will send you off the edge. And so we have to understand part of understanding injustice is accepting the world that we live in, that it's going to be unjust. Things are not right. Good people get hurt. Bad people get off, but not in the ultimate sense. They're not going to get off on their penalty. God will gonna, is one day going to hold them accountable for what they have done. But it seems like right now it's just, well, they do something and uh, there's, there's no justice to this. It's coming. But you have to remind yourself of that. And then, like I said, to, all through this, this broadcast today is we're experiencing a high level of frustration. High, high levels of frustration. Because it's constant. It's every week. It's something, something that's going on. A lot of this is attacking us. A lot of us see that our efforts and what we're doing to take a stand against it is failing. Now, now again, you have to get, understand what's happening. A lot of people say, well, the world's changing. What's the point? And they just let it go. Look, I made this point before. You and I are not going to change the world. We're not going to change the way the tide is going. All you're responsible for is dealing with your circle of influence. That's your mission realm. You don't need to worry about Pope Francis in that sense. But if someone is a, a, a following Pope Francis, you can help them to see the truth about the matter. That's, that's what we're trying to do is limit that frustration to understand you can only control what you can control. Let everything else go. So people get so frustrated because they can't do anything. Their hands are tied, they feel, and they have no power. And so they have this extreme frustration. You won't be so frustrated if you understand what your responsibility is. And see, frustration it, it comes from unmet expectations of yourself. And, and so like if you think, well, I should be able to change things. I should, we should be able as Christians to change the world. It's a good thought, but it's not in reality. We would like the world to change, but you and I both know if it's predicted, this is the way it's going to go down. The world that we're looking for comes in the Messianic Kingdom for the thousand-year rule of Christ. It's not coming now. And you have to be okay with that. Meet the expectations that you're responsible for, and that's it. Quit keeping this dream alive that things will get better. That will keep you out of reality and keep you extremely frustrated. And that segues into this other thing of unrealistic expectations about God or others. If you notice, I talked about massive persecution happening all over the globe. Now, people who have unrealistic expectations believe that God should rescue every person from persecution uh, and that others shouldn't treat Christians this way. Well, that's just unrealistic. As you know, throughout the centuries, God has allowed his believers to be persecuted. He has allowed them to be martyred. He has that. He has done that. And in rare occasions, he does save them and whatnot. But for the most part, they endure the persecution. If you think he should stop the persecution, then you have an unrealistic expectation. God is allowing human freedom. Yes, it's ramping up and getting worse, but you have to accept the principle of human freedom because human freedom means that bad things are going to happen to you, not only from this world, but from other people. Quit having the idea of, well, my destiny, my life should be like this. Um, or I wish things were different. That is unrealistic expectations, and it keeps you in a state of frustration. And it makes you very angry, not only at the world, but it makes you angry at God.
because you're going to say, why doesn't he change this? Why is he allowing this? And that's wrong. That comes from unrealistic expectations. Or a lot of people get angry at circumstances. They expect that their life is going to go a certain way. They expect good things to always come to them. And when it doesn't, they're disappointed and become frustrated. And they say, well, this is not what I expected. My life didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. Well, in a lot of ways, you had no control over that. The world was bent because of the fall. Uh, God's providence allowed certain things. And so your life has, has taken different directions than you wished. But unfortunately, if you fight that, if you protest that, and you get into a wrestling match with God, all you're going to do is be angry at him. And you have to then realize you are where you're at for a reason. God has a plan and a purpose. And it may not be the life you chose, but it was the best for you. It was the best to make you like Christ. It was the way to get to being mature spiritually and to be conformed to his image. And you have to be okay with that. Another aspect that people get angry about is over loss. You know, we're, we're angry about the loss of our country, the loss of the Judeo-Christian ethic in our country. We're losing, we're losing something. You know, we get angry of losing a person if they die. We get angry of losing a relationship because the person can't get their head screwed on straight or whatnot, and we lose. Well, part of this life is accepting loss because if you don't accept loss, you're gonna be angry about it. And, and you have to understand, why are you so angry for losing things like money, a job, or whatever? What it shows you is you perhaps are holding on to things of this world too tightly and the Lord's trying to show you, let it go. The only thing you have in this life is me, the Lord is saying, and I'm your security, I'm your provider. You shouldn't be so angry over losing things of the world. It's all gonna be burned up anyway. But people have a struggle with that. Another issue that people struggle with in anger is that they have their, their perceived rights that have been violated. Now, there's no doubt people can violate your rights, you know, your inalienable rights, obviously. Um, but a lot of people make up rights for themselves, uh, what we call perceived rights. They think they should have this. They think that life should go this way. They think people should treat them this way. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen. And so they get angry about their rights being violated. And a lot of these rights are just some, simply made up in their head. Well, anyway, that's not the mindset of Jesus. The mindset of Jesus, he became a doulos. He became a servant to the Father. And when you're a doulos, it means a servant has no rights. And we are servants to God and Jesus, as you know. And as Jesus did, he yielded his rights to the Heavenly Father. So based on the Bible, we have the right to live in the light of God's will as his as revealed in his word. Other than that, we are to yield our rights to the Lord and let him have his way in our hearts. And, and so you have to understand, I can't change the situation. Um, and, and, you know, people are going to violate your rights and you have to get, learn to deal with that and give those rights up. Jesus said in one, in one passage, he says, if someone wants your coat, you can give it to them. We say, well, that's a violation of rights, not his. Well, what did he say? Give your right to own that. Give it away. Because it's going to constantly happen to you. You're going to lose things in this life. And now you're going to lose things even more. And so if you want to protest that, you can. But you're going to get extremely angry and frustrated with everything. So be willing to lose your rights. You get everything back, rest assured, in the kingdom era in the kingdom age. You'll get all your things back to you and more. So here's the question we want to end with. These are the sources of anger. We have to deal with them. We have to get them to a biblical level in order to subside our anger and subside our righteous indignation. Now here's the deal. In understanding anger, anger is a gift from God. But here's the question you have to ask when you're angry. Can I change the situation? Can I change the situation? If yes, 
then do something about it. If you don't like the way the world's getting, you don't like the way the Christian church is getting, then do something about it. Well, what do you mean? Maybe start a YouTube channel. Maybe start a blog. Maybe start a website. Maybe start a class at your church. Well, you say, well, my church doesn't buy into all this. Well, then form another group outside of the church and get like-minded believers who are on the same page as you and get together and meet once a week and talk about these things and figure out things you can do. There's always something you can do in your sphere of influence. And again, we're not saying that you're going to have a meeting with Putin or or any of these world leaders or Erdogan and say, hey, you need to stop doing what you're doing to Israel. That's not going to happen. You need to go to your circle of influence, and that's all God is asking you to do. Now, the other answer is, can I change the situation? If no, then you're required to release it. Don't hold on to it. Don't go in protest mode. Don't wrestle with God. Release it. It is the only way you can survive in dealing with anger. You must release it. You must forgive. Because if not, you will poison up your own soul by not releasing it. You will poison yourself by not forgiving. And if you do that, you'll end up a bitter and angry person that really no one wants to be around because you, you will get so fouled up. You will be cantankerous. You will be bitter. And, and at that point, you've really messed up how you're functioning. So think about those things as we deal with all the issues of the day and how to deal with our own anger, okay? Well, that brings us to our conclusion today. Thanks for joining us and watch us next week as we discern the signs of the times and see things through the lens of scripture. And remember what Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. God bless you. See you next week.